afternoon. Um, as you're still settling in, let me just make uh, two quick preliminary notes I'd like to normally start with. Um, the first has to do with our dependence, addiction, I don't know what you want to call it, on little smart devices that you like to go, you know, tappy-tappy on them. Um, on some level I understand it, but it's not so much, I'm going to ask you to try not to do that during the lecture, not so much out of, you know, respect for the lecture or the person who's making this announcement. No, no, that's not. It's just, it's more of a challenge. Can you keep yourself away from those tippy-tappy things for 50 minutes? If you can't, I'm so sorry. I, I feel for you. Uh, but if you can, at least, you know, you can say, well, 50 minutes, I didn't check my social media thingy. The world didn't end. Uh, so that's my first request. Try to stay away from your digital lives for the next 50 minutes. Um, I'll try to help you for, with that, by the way, as much as I can. Uh, the second and preliminary note has to do with, you know, actually related to that first note. I know sometimes in lectures we tend to, you know, doze off or trip off or whatnot, and that's fine, you know, that's, uh, I guess. But I, I just ask one thing uh, of all of you. Do, uh, as, and as much as we may respect your right not, you know, to, to tune out, do allow those who want to tune in to tune in. And so try to doze out in, in silence. Um, I know we can get chit-chatty sometimes, and that's fine, but not really, because others have a right to listen if they so wish to do. That's my two preliminary notes. Um, with that, let me introduce the basic um, framework for today's presentation um, entitled Phil Philosophy from El Andalus. Um, two main protagonists for today's presentation are Ibn Rushd and Ibn Maymun. Um, and the, the basic aims of, of today's lecture, threefold and as, as I have them set out on your fly sheet, uh, primarily to introduce to you the place and kind of uh, condition and situation of falsafa, of philosophy, uh, in the Arab Islamic world of the time, both in the Eastern as well as the Western uh, part. Um, Eastern, we normally go back to, you know, Baghdad and the situatedness of that area, but today we're also shifting to Al-Andalus. Uh, the second aim is to introduce you to some of the key um, aims, key objectives of the works uh, that you're going to be covering from these two authors, Ibn Rushd and Ibn Maymun. Um, and the third, to kind of place it in the, in the larger context of a discussion uh, on the place and role of philosophy uh, within an Islamic monotheistic tradition. Um, and as far as to, to is trying to do is to give you an encounter with various expressions of monotheistic thought and various traditions of expressing that monotheistic thought, be it in the autobiographical works that you encountered, certainly with St. Augustine, but as well as with Al-Ghazali to some extent, as well as more perhaps some hint of certain polemical works. Um, soon you'll be reading also poetics of Dante and whatnot. And today we're going to take a look at the question of the role of philosophy uh, within that context of encountering monotheistic traditions and how they viewed uh, the role and place of philosophy. Of course, you should have already got a sense of that with Al-Ghazali as well as Ikhwan al-Safa. So, in order to do so, I'm going to ask you to indulge me with a little digression and start slightly before uh, our time covered here, uh, before our friends Ibn Rushd and Maymun, Ibn Maymun, pardon, and slight going back to the entry of and the place of philosophy in the Arab Islamic context. And the word philosophy I'm, I'm using here is to signify particularly falsafa, right? Not just philosophical thought and philosophical tradition or rational investigation. That's the broader, of course, context. But we're talking about falsafa particularly. Um, and normally we place the entry in the 8th century um, common era or AD, um, somewhere around the 2nd century Hijri, particularly in Baghdad. And most particularly, if you want to name someone, uh, one would name usually uh, Al-Kindi, Abu Yusuf Yaqub ibn Ishaq Al-Kindi, who's known as Faylasuf Al-Arab. Right? Uh, nowadays, if you say that, it'll have a negative connotation, ah, Faylasuf Al-Arab. But of course, at the time, it had a very positive connotation. Uh, being the first such Faylasuf, at least um, explicitly recognized as such, but also being the first self-proclaimed, if you wish, practitioner of philosophy. Um, and the entry of Falsafa, 
um, of course, through the translation movements, and I'm sure that was previously addressed in uh, the previous lectures, through these, the really genuine interest in studying the various prior, if you wish, traditions, civilizations, cultures, uh, whichever word you want to loosely use there, um, and their encounter particularly with the Greek tradition, and their um, genuine interest in translating, studying, and understanding these various texts from the philosophical tradition, uh, particularly the Greek philosophical tradition, which was basically the, the mood of the 8th century, 9th century Baghdad, what some people would refer to as the golden age of Baghdad. Again, you know, with these labels, I don't know how accurately you want to take them, but there was certainly some, something going on, right? Um, what is perhaps most significant about that period is that the interest in studying philosophy slash science, uh, as you'll see, was directly supported by the powers to be, directly supported by the caliphs, right, the various caliphs of the time. Um, in fact, Al-Kindi, whose name I mentioned earlier, was himself a tutor uh, to one of the sons uh, of the caliphs. So this was not something that was happening on the margin, this was something happening very much at the center of the sociopolitical uh, arena, so to speak. And perhaps that's why it became so prominent and so prolific and so many works and so many thinkers and uh, um, figures you can mention in that tradition. Um, their writing is really, really brilliantly prolific. Um, there's a nice bibliography, uh, if you wish, uh, compiled by a bookseller of the time, Nadim, uh, which we refer to as Fehrist and Nadim. If you're ever interested, you can go and look what kind of books were being sold and being known uh, around the ninth century, uh, I guess. And just for Al-Kindi, for instance, he lists over 200, 300 entries. Um, he doesn't have much for those after him because he was writing before Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, the, the, the more known, perhaps, figures of the time. In brief, whenever I say that, I usually fail. Uh, it's, it's very rarely in brief, so I apologize. But in brief, um, the place of falsafa, philosophy, and science, along with it, in that era of Baghdad was very kind of fully supported, fully there, uh, and there was a very natural coexistence, so to speak, between what you might call the mainstream theological traditions and the uh, philosophical traditions. This, of course, connects also to a tradition of Alm al-Kalam that was at the time. Uh, the prominent Kalam school of the time was the Mu'tazila, right? Uh, and if you're not familiar with the Mu'tazila, basically it's, you know, a school of thought which fully accepted that key questions of monotheism, which you'll see how, for instance, Ibn Rushd and uh, Ibn Maymun will address, um, could be resolved by reference to rational argumentation. Not yet philosophical argumentation in the classical kind of systematic sense that you'll see now with Ibn Rushd, for instance, but certainly through rational argumentations. And when I say key questions, key questions such as the unity of the divine, divine justice, um, attribution or non-attribution of certain qualities to the divine, right? And these sound very theoretical, but if you come down to them, their implement implication and, and application are very central, okay? On what basis does one say that we either earn or not eternal bliss, otherwise known as heaven, or eternal damnation, hell, right? Um, you know, religiously, theoretically, we answer these questions. So, well, you know, if you've been good, you go to heaven, if you've been bad, you go to hell. Um, what have been, I don't think any of us have been, or can be just good or just bad. What if I've been partly so-and-so, right? What then? Uh, what happens to someone who um, comes late to repent, for instance, or to conversion? These are central questions for the theologians, and as you'll see later on, the philosophers, how they will address them and try to make sense of them. Um, Questions, for instance, of do I earn my reward or punishment? Do, is it my doing that has me end up either in heaven or in hell, or is this divine, right? Because technically my actions shouldn't influence the divine, right? Um, if I'm throwing too much at you, at one go, sorry, yeah, but I mean, th these guys tend to do so. Um, but there is a serious question, and at the time, for instance, the Mu'tazila were addressing these questions with a rationalist bent, trying to make sense of things. And because of that, for instance, they fully fall on the side of free will, for instance, right? The idea that it, it, it makes very much rational sense that it is my actions uh, that will have consequences, right? Um, and yes, there was a position as opposed to this. There was a position that said, for instance, no, that's really up to God, uh, fully up to God. Um, the philosophical 
injection into this discussion it kind of seems natural. That's why I'm bringing up this background, right? So when, they, when you encounter the works of the classical Greeks at the time, it makes sense that for a lot of thinkers and figures and authors such as Al-Kindi and what we refer as the, uh, the circle of Al-Kindi, right? Uh, found in these works um, lots of ammunition, lots of material that they could use to help them address pertinent questions to their times. So this is not philosophy in the sense of being uh, an exercise as the cliche sometimes has it, and it is a cliche, uh, sometimes has it, you know, philosophy is kind of an exercise which is not connected to surrounding existence and milieu. On the contrary, this was a philosophy very much engaged with this milieu, very much centered on the questions of the time. Um, and as I say philosophy, we also say science, right? And these are illustrations, not all from the same era, but they are illustrative. Uh, they're pretty good, I think. So you see, for instance, when we speak of philosophy nowadays, we think of it as that which is not the exact and natural sciences. Uh, but that's very recent. Up to perhaps the 18th century, maybe even 19th century, philosophy did, of course, include uh, the natural sciences, such as marine biology, right? Lovely illustrations of interesting fish there. Uh, of course, astrology, somewhat uh, connected with, you know, nowadays what we understand as astrology, but it's actually astronomy astrology, right? And of course, engineering, geometry, algebra, etc. So all of that was very, very richly being engaged in at the time um, in Baghdad. And this is where we normally place the entry of falsafa and the philosophical sciences there. Um, and one of, for instance, one of the distinctions they would make is between the old sciences and the new sciences. The old sciences being those they are receiving from the Greek and the Hellenic and the Indo-Persian traditions, perhaps. And the new sciences, of course, the Islamic sciences, the religious sciences, al-kalam, al-fiqh, etc. But at a certain moment, and of course the analysis why, we're not even going to go into it, but you have, I think, a sense of it. Uh, the tide changes, the tide turns against the prominence of falsafa and uloom in that sense uh, in Baghdad. Um, Coincidentally or not, I don't know, but it's, it's around the time of uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, who is himself an ex-Mu'tazila, and of course his student, uh, whom you've already met, uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Right? And there's, there's a movement kind of that undermines the place and role of philosophy, if not more. Uh, it certainly is antagonistic to it. Um, it certainly stands up against uh, the, the exercise of falsafa. But that's actually inaccurate. Because for instance, in the work that you encountered from Al-Ghazali, nowhere is he standing up full and totally against philosophy. It's more the application of philosophy on certain questions related to the monotheistic uh, investigations. In, in Munqid bin al-Dalal, he particularly emphasizes the realm of metaphysics, right? On other realms, for instance, Al-Ghazali, he says, you know, you know and as much as I worry about people who blindly follow mathematics, I worry about people who blindly reject mathematics. That's problematic as well. Same thing with the natural sciences. But there's a certain realm, which is basically metaphysics, um, the divine and questions of the soul and the intellect and whatnot, which he certainly warns us against and he's certainly antagonistic against. Um, now, for whatever reason, what happens there, um, it, there is certainly a decline um, at least a noted decline. It's never really just the end, as some people say, the end of, uh, I don't think philosophy ends. But there's a certain decline uh, of, uh, in, in the presence of philosophy in you know, the East, the Arab Islamic part, uh, the Eastern Arab Islamic part. Um, and there's a certain sense of defeat, yes, in the idea that whereas you know, for a couple of centuries, philosophy was the key reference point for central questions, central discussions, uh, it takes a backseat, to say the least. In the Western part of the Arab Islamic world, a similar yet slightly different story also unfolds. Likewise, there was also a sense of antagonism to philosophy in Maghrib, you know, uh, North Africa and Andalus for a while. That also turned, again, interestingly, with the change in political powers, um, which seemed to also always have an influence on um, the prominence of the sciences and philosophy. And so with Ahmed ibn Tumar, for instance, coming on the scene in the northwestern Spanish part of the Arab Islamic world, you have a revival and a phenomenal interest in the rise of the sciences and philosophy. And um, for instance, in Baghdad, uh, at one point, they, you know, very prominent place, the House of Wisdom, Beit al-Hikmah, was a central, you know, uh, place of study and 
philosophical investigation as well as other, of course, forms. So Cordoba, for instance, takes it upon himself uh, to establish its own version of Beit al-Hikmah, its own version of the House of Wisdom. And they import so many manuscripts, both from the, Arab, uh, the eastern part of the Arab Islamic world as well as from other parts of the world. And they have a huge library, at one point reported to have, I don't know, 400,000 manuscripts, maybe more, 600,000 manuscripts. Uh, and Cordoba, in general, becomes the seat of learning and consciously, right? The rulers consciously wanted to outdo the heyday of, of Baghdad, right? So this is a conscious project, right? And so they start to literally uh, lure in great thinkers, great minds and support them and whatnot. Uh, one known figure of the time, for instance, Ibn Tufayl, um, who was a friend, a personal friend of Ibn Rushd, and actually that's how Ibn Rushd came into the court of the time. Part of his, other than you know, being very close to the court and being a known philosopher and uh, uh, student, in the sense he studies uh, ancient classical Greek texts, part of his role was to identify new talents, so to speak, and invite them to the court. Um, a bit like a football scout these days. You, know, you send a football scout and identify new talent for clubs. Um, and that's, he's the one who kind of invited, recognized the young Ibn Rushd and invited him to the court and introduced him uh, to the ruler of the time. So in as much as you can speak of uh, the heyday of Baghdad in terms of its philosophical, you know, the philosophical tradition, something similar begins to happen uh, in Andalus in the 11th, particularly in the 12th century, certainly, um, almost rivaling, some would suggest, uh, the great days of philosophy and intellectual activities in Baghdad. And this is a time where you encounter figures like, as we mentioned already, Ibn Tufayl, Ibn Rushd, uh, Ibn Baja, um, Fakhreddin al-Razi, and certainly Ibn Maymun as well. The two authors we've been looking at, oh, sorry, we will be looking at are of course already mentioned there. Done with my digression, not brief. Um, so let me start off very, very briefly by introducing our two authors of today. All of this biographical information these days is so available, so I'm not going to go into it in details. Just very, very briefly to look at, this is Ibn Rushd, Abu walid Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Rushd, who you'll see was very much immersed in all aspects of a scholar of the time. Um, so when we speak about him in terms of reference to philosophy, please always keep in mind he was also a Qadi, right? a Qadi Shara in that sense. So he was a very prominent judge of the time. In fact, at one point he was appointed chief judge of Cordoba. He also comes from a, prominent, a family of prominent uh, judges and political or at least social figures. Um, very much known for his influence on the movement of Arab Islamic philosophy, especially his work on Aristotle, which, by the way, was prompted by a question of the ruler at the time. Um, Abu Yusuf Yaqub went to Ibn Tufayl, and he was telling him, there's a certain aspect of Aristotle I'm not fully grasping, if you could help elucidate it. Ibn Tufayl at the time was fully immersed in his greatest work, as far as he's concerned, which Unfortunately, uh, sorry, fortunately that it survives. Unfortunately, it's the only work that survives from him. Hay um, ibn Yaqdan, beautiful work of literature of the time. So he was writing that, and so he's, he says, look, I'm, I'm a kind of a bit busy, uh, but I know someone with great talent who can help us elucidate Aristotle, and that's how he brings in Ibn Rushd and introduces him to the court, and he be begins to write commentaries uh, on Aristotle. And then Ibn Rushd falls from grace. Right? This is the the anticlimax of the story. Um, different stories what happens. One story is that uh, it was brought to the attention of the rulers by the theologians that in one of his works, Ibn Rushd has referenced Venus as a goddess uh, in a marginal note. And of course, you know, for the Romans, yes, she was. Uh, but for a monotheist to reference Venus as a goddess is not very... Uh, well, will not be taken kindly, right? That's just one story. There's different stories. And another story, apparently, that the, the ruler took insult to something that Ibn Rushd wrote. Anyway, he was exiled, Haram, and uh, he died in exile. Um, he was later brought back and buried uh, in Cordoba, but initially he was buried in Marrakesh. So that's the first author you'll be encountering. The second author, Ibn Maymun. Maimonides means Ibn Maymun, by the way. The I-D-E-S uh, suffix to the name means the son of, right? So in the great documentary 300, uh, Leonidas is the son of Leon, right? So this is Maimonides, the son of Ibn Maimun, sorry, the son of Maimun. Um, contemporary, more or less, around the same time as Ibn Rushd, 
interested, as you'll see, very similar questions as Ibn Rushd. Uh, we actually do believe they communicated, uh, and certainly he's read some of Ibn Rushd's works. Very similar to Ibn Rushd, again, and this is the biographical uh, parts that I'm interested in. Again, a key religious figure of his community, right? He was um, not just engaged in you know, philosophy as apart from, on the contrary, this was part of his being a key religious figure. At one point, he was appointed as the prince of his community, uh, religious that is, right? Uh, he was also, by the way, the physician for Salah al-Din, once he chose exile, a bit like Ibn Rushd, uh, and went to Egypt, uh, he was a um, physician. Ibn Rushd was also a doctor back in Cordoba. So you see this kind of whole roundedness, and when we speak about philosophy, science, it's all kind of medicine, theology, philosophy, legislation, right? Both of these figures represent uh, the, the coming together of the classical philosophical traditions along with the monotheistic traditions of their time. And so in their very own being, they represent the argument that they will be representing in their texts. Because essentially the key aim of their works is to show the centrality of philosophy in a monotheistic context, right? And so they're very being these religious figures of their time, whether as a chief judge or was a, whether as a rabbi, um, as well as being so engaged with philosophy, particularly Aristotelian philosophy, as well as being engaged in medicine and practicing medical doctors of their time, all of that is precisely the kind of vision and picture they want to present about the place and role of philosophy. Uh, so their own being is an argument <laughs> in some sense. Good. Just checking the time. Oh, it's very good. All right. So with that being said, uh, let's now dive into some illustrations uh, of these authors' main ideas taken from their text. Obviously, I'm not going to cover the, both texts in their entirety, nowhere near. What I want to do now with you is to give you illustrations of these key concerns that they both have, right? And they share common concerns, and they share common aims in their work. At the very heart of it, as I already said, it's to, to show clearly, to illustrate why we need philosophy, falsafa, right, and the classical meaning of the term um, within a monotheistic, an Islamic monotheistic context for Ibn Rushd, or a Judaic monotheistic context for Ibn Maymun, but a monotheistic context both ways, right? What role is there for falsafa, if any? Um, and to show that very clearly using tools which are very interestingly not only rooted in philosophy, but equally rooted in their milieu, in their monotheistic traditions. This is especially true of Ibn Rushd, by the way, but also of Ibn Maymun, but you're, you're reading very small selections from his work. So we'll start with Ibn Rushd. Um, and this is on, I think the translation you read is on the harmony of philosophy and religion, I think, which is not the exact translation of the title. The title of his uh, work is Kitab Fasl al-Maqal wa Taqreer ma bayn al-Hikmah wa sharia man al-Tisal, right, which is usually translated as a decisive treatise determining the nature of the connection between religion and philosophy. Note, however, and I think it's an important note, that in the Arabic, uh, the, the title doesn't mention the word falsafa nor religion, right? It is وَتَقْرِيرْ مَا بَيْنَ الْحِكْمَةِ وَالشَّرِيعَةِ مِنَ الْتِصَالِ Right? And the, the crux of uh, the, the main subject matter of the work is actually religious law uh, in as much as it is, a, it is, of course, hikmah. Now, hikmah is not, you know, that far removed from philosophy, of course, because philosophia or falsafa is the love of wisdom. And that's one of the definitions that uh, these authors fully understood and explicitly stated, for instance, in their books of definition, if you ever read, for instance, Al-Kindis or, or whatever. So... It's not that he's removing himself from that. But hikmah is a, is a local word. It's an Arabic word. Uh, it's, it's a word that occurs very frequently uh, in the Holy Quran, whereas, of course, the word philosophy doesn't. So I think that's an interesting choice of words uh, that Ibn Rushd uses. Now, the title itself is very telling of the project, right? Uh, it's almost an, a response to the question, uh, Ya Abu Walid, what are you planning to do with this work? He says, well, you know, I'm going to give you the decisive uh, treatise that determines the nature of the connection between philosophy and religion, right? So this is the object of the work. How does one do that? And he begins with a very interesting entry point. It's an if entry point, but it's not a hypothetical if. It's, it's, it's more of a given that, right, either, right? So he says, all right, let the first question we need to determine is the following. And note that 
the very beginnings of his work show him off as the Judas that he is. Right? He doesn't write this work, and I'll come back to emphasize this point, as a philosopher interested in um, presenting an argument for philosophy. He's writing this as a believer, as a monotheist and a Judas, interested in really objectively addressing the question, is there a place for philosophy? Right? And so the, the basic idea is we need to determine the attitude of the law. And whenever you read the term law in Ibn Rushd's work, by the way, that's religious law, right? Sharia or shara, right? We have to determine the attitude of religious law towards philosophy. And that means, does the religious law allow it? If it allows it, does it command it? Or does it forbid it? Okay? And that's a key question as a jurist. Because if you can show, for instance, that religious law forbids the study of philosophy, end of discussion. Right? That's it. So that's the question. What is the attitude of the religious law towards philosophy? And this is the uh, some kind of summation that he begins with. Uh, this is not a conclusion. This is what he will prove, of course, or show. He writes, if the activity of philosophy is nothing more than the study of existing beings and reflection upon them as indications of the artisan, and if the law has encouraged and urged reflection on beings, then it is clear that what this name signifies, philosophy, is either obligatory or recommended by law. Right? Uh, in in Deductive reasoning, this is a very basic illustration of two premises leading to a conclusion, right? So one, if philosophy is such and, and so. Two, if the law has encouraged such and so. Therefore, so that then here is a, is a logical conclusion, right? Therefore, it is clear that what this name signifies is either obligatory or recommended by law. So we'll start with the second premise. If the law has encouraged and urged reflection on beings, has it? Has the religious law urged and encouraged reflection on beings, on mawjudat, on makhluqat? Or Take a wild guess. It's a yes or no, right? Yes. Yes is the right answer. Ibn um, Rushd says, of course, yes. Absolutely. Right? And this is him, again, as a jurist now responding. Okay? And so his illustrations are not from Aristotle. His illustrations are from the Quran. He says, here's an example. One of the verses says, reflect you have vision. Here's another. Have they not studied the kingdom of the heavens and the earth and whatever things God has created? Right? So he's, and of course, there's others that you can give. So for Ibn Rushd, there's clear textual evidence that we are urged and encouraged to reflect upon beings, to study beings. Right? Um, the first is imperative. Right? It's amr. Reflect, you have vision. The second is more kind of encouraging. Have you not done so? Now, Ibn Rush says, if anything, uh, within kind of religious um, attitude or the, the attitude of religious law towards it, if something is both encouraged and commanded, the commandment takes precedence, right? So you will find many verses which encourage studying and reflecting upon being. You will find some verses which seem to command us, but just having one verse that commands is enough because commandment is higher. Right? So according to him, it's not only that the law encourages us to do that, it actually commands us to do that. It commands us to reflect upon being. Fine. To chassil falsafi. Because that's, that's the real crux of the argument that he wants to propose, right? So from that, he says, let me show you the place and role of philosophy. Okay? We'll start with this. Reflect, you have vision. Well, what is reflection? What does it mean to reflect? Ibn Rush says, reflection is nothing more then inference and drawing out the unknown from the known. And since, right, this is a given, since this is reasoning, or at any rate done by reasoning, therefore we are under an obligation to carry our study of beings by intellectual reasoning. Right? So he's following on that first. So first the law urges us, commands us to reflect upon beings. Well, what is reflection is such and so, which needs intellectual reasoning. Therefore, that's what we need to do. But now if we are to engage in intellectual reasoning, we need the tools to do so, right? Because intellectual reasoning is not just think about it. Right? Intellectual reasoning is, is a whole methodology of how one reasons, okay? Um, and so if we are to engage in intellectual reasoning and reflection upon these beings, being, right? Wujud and mawjudat, both. For Ibn Rushd, this necessarily leads to two conclusions from these, right? The first 
is that we have to learn the methods of reasoning, the proper methods of reasoning. Because if, because if this is so serious, I mean, it must be serious, the law is commanding us to do it, right? We have to make sure we're doing it properly. And so we need to go and study the various methods of reasoning, um, intellectual reasoning particularly, since, as he says, it's the highest form of reasoning. Um, what would be a proper mode of reasoning? What are the different modes of reasoning? Um, how can I distinguish between valid reasoning and invalid reasoning? Right? What premises can I use? What premises sh shouldn't I use? All of this is involved in preparing oneself to conduct intellectual reasoning properly. Right? But that automatically means that I need to go and study books that have been written about this. Now, if, there's, bless you, if there are no books that are written about this, fine. I'll start from scratch. But in any science, if there are good works that have already done, been done, if there are good resources that one can already reference, this is not just true of intellectual reasoning, of, of anything, right? Wh one doesn't start from scratch. One builds on what's been done, right? And guess what? <laughs> Work has been done already uh, by the classical tradition, the Greco-Roman tradition particularly, right? So we go to them. And we look at what Aristotle has done because, you know, Aristotle has done so much in terms of identifying and delineating the various forms of intellectual reasoning, the various forms of identifying, you know, bad reasoning from good reasoning, and et cetera. Um, and he as he says, this is not just true of philosophy. This is true of any art, any art you want to engage in. Suppose I want to do fiqh, right? Uh, or I want to do, you know, mathematics. Do I just start from scratch? No, I go and start where others have, what work has already been done in the field. Good? Now, if we were to object to Ibn Rushd and say, all right, but, they, but they, here we have a slight difference concern than, say, one we have in mathematics, right? Mathematics is not something we're pursuing as a fulfillment of a commandment by the law. Now, this is, as you say, a commandment by the law, reflect you have vision. To do so, and in doing so, to rely on the works of non-monotheists is a bit problematic, right? So how do I go, how do I justify my going to the books of those we would certainly not consider you know, within the mo uh, Muslim uh, uh, monotheistic tradition, let alone the monotheistic tradition. And he anticipates that kind of objection. He says, but that's irrelevant, really, because um, where I get the tool from has nothing to do with how I use the tool. And he gives a very interesting illustration, which has the, the, the context of which is uh, al-adha, right? So he says, if I were as a Muslim, as a devout Muslim, I needed to present the sacrifice in Al-Adha, but I don't have the proper knife to do so. I go to my neighbor and I choose their knife. I borrow their knife. My neighbor happens to be Jewish and I borrow the knife from them and I perform the sacrifice. Does that in any way invalidate the sacrifice? And again, Ibn Rushd al says, nope. Because what matters is the performance of the sacrifice is in line with how I'm supposed to do it, irrespective of where I got the tool, right? So likewise, when I say I'm going to go look at these philosophical works that have already been done on the subject matter, I'm going to do so and use them within the confines, or sorry, I shouldn't use the term confines, within the, um, let's say, the guidelines of the Islamic monotheistic tradition, and especially within the guidelines of the Arabic language, as he says. So in brief, here it goes again in brief, one can summarize the argument as follows. And this, all of this, by the way, is in the first couple of pages of your readings, right? The rest follows from this. So if we want to go back now of, you know, if philosophy is the study of existing beings as indicative of the artisan, and if the law has urged us to do so or, or encouraged us to do so, then philosophy or the law has encouraged us, rather commanded us to study philosophy. And this is how he summarized, well, this is how we're summarizing his argument. So he begins by the premise that the law does indeed oblige us to study beings and reflect upon them, right? But reflection is only possible through intellectual reasoning, the highest of which is demonstrative reasoning, right? From this, he moves to say, this means one has to study the rules and principles of reasoning, but this means one has to study the works of those before us who have done works on these matters of reasoning and whatnot. Having gained the skill, I come back now and I apply myself to the study of beings, Unlike with any other art, of course, I study whatever has been done before me in that same field. As such, 
the law obliges us to study philosophy, which is a really heavy conclusion for many of us who don't want to study philosophy, right? But of course, Ibn Rushd is not saying this is an obligation for every single person who wants to lay claim to being a faithful Muslim. He's saying this is an obligation for everyone who can, right? And he, again, as a jurist, he thinks that's true of all obligations in religion. Uh, prayer is obliged for those who can. Pilgrimage is obliged for those who can, right? And likewise, so to suggest that this is now, you know, all of, any one of us who wants to claim to be a devout Muslim monotheist has to now go and get a minor in philosophy, that's not what he's suggesting at all, right? But it sounds like he's suggesting there are those who can and those who can't. Well, he's not suggesting that, he's saying that very explicitly. Um, Whoever forbids the study, so he goes from uh, defending the place and role of philosophy to attacking anyone who forbids it, like Abu Hamid. In fact, Abu Hamid is one of the few characters he mentions by name in this text, Abu Hamid being Ghazali. Whoever forbids the study of them, i.e. the works of philosophy, to anyone who is fit to study them, you see? Now the qualifier, i.e. anyone who unites two qualities, natural intelligence, dhaka al-fitra, and religious integrity and moral virtue, right? So now he passes his qualification in there of who should be studying them, who is fit to study these works of philosophy. Okay? So he's very clear, this is not for everyone, but for those fit to study them. Anyone who forbids them for those fit to study them is committing a huge error, as he says, is blocking people from the door by which the law summons them to the knowledge of God, and such an act is the extreme of ignorance and estrangement from God the exalted. Right? So any stance such as Al-Ghazali's perhaps, that says you, we, we cannot study the books of philosophy or etc., is actually in some sense stopping us from fulfilling a commandment because according to Ibn Rushd, the law commands us to study beings and we can only do this by studying philosophy. If somebody comes along and says, no, you can't, essentially they're stopping me from fulfilling the commandment. Right? Very clever turning the defense into the attack. Mahdoun. Good. Sorry. Um, now, from there, of course, he anticipates a number of objections, a number of counter-arguments. I'll just throw them out very briefly and leave them for your class discussions. Arguments such as, um, what about the errors that are committed in the study of philosophy? Are you suggesting, uh, Abu, Abu Walid, pardon, that there are no errors that one can commit in philosophy, right? Um, and of course, he says, no, I understand there could be errors, but it's not the kind of errors that Al-Ghazali uh, Al is concerned with, uh, because somehow Al-Ghazali missed a certain important distinction there. Um, and so he actually responds to Al-Ghazali's three points about, you know, the philosopher believe in the eternality of the world, believe that the soul, uh, only the soul is resurrected, not body and soul, and that God's knowledge is of universals, not particulars. Pay attention to how he responds to these three points. Uh, nowhere does Ibn Rushd present himself as being on the side of the philosopher as opposed to Al-Ghazali, right? Because he also has some issues with the philosopher, by the way. Right, and you'll see it in his conclusion, uh, concluding sections. But he wants to distinguish between having a critique of a philosopher versus philosophy. So philosophers can certainly make errors. He believes Al Farabi and Ibn Sina have made some, right? But that is not the same as a critique on the place and role of philosophy, of falsafa itself. In fact, it's falsafa that tells us that Al Farabi committed an error, right? And there is other, of course. Uh, key points that to be addressed, and I'll, I'll leave them for your class discussion. Uh, what I want to conclude with in terms of presenting this illustration, and here you can see very clearly the, the main purpose, the main goal of Ibn Rushd in this text. This is from the concluding part of his uh, essay. He says, our soul is in the utmost sorrow and pain by reason of the evil fancies and per per pardon, perverse, perverted beliefs which have infiltrated religion, particularly this is a key point. Such afflictions as have happened to it at the hands of people who claim an affinity with philosophy. He believes damage has been done by people who claim to be you know, affiliated with falsafa. Injuries from people related to philosophy are the severest to religion. At the same time, however, he says, religion has also been hurt by a host of ignorant friends who claim an affinity with it. These are the sects which exist within it, right? And this is, his main concern is to alleviate this strange injury and conflict uh, within the monotheist, Islamic monotheistic tradition uh, 
whether it be injuries that have happened to it at the hands who claim affinity to religion or at the hands of those who claim affinity to philosophy. And he believes both have been culprit uh, in this. Right? In brief, his, his, his entire movement is not simply a question of, I want to defend philosophy. If you look at the text and you note how far for Ibn Rushd the place and role of philosophy is directly related to an understanding of the truths of revelation, his defense of philosophy is essentially a defense of religion. He doesn't see them as separable at all. Coming at the discussion from a similar direction, Ibn Maymun also raises and addresses uh, a certain set of questions in his work. You, again, you're reading short selections from that work. It's a huge work. Uh, the Guide for the Perplexed. Dalalat al Ha'irin. That's, by the way, a facsimile of one of the pages. You know, it's written in, in Hebrew characters, but it's actually Arabic. So if you were to actually read the, out loud what he's written, it's actually Arabic, but he uses a bit like what you do when you message using English. Right? Uh, because Arabic was, of course, the lingua franca of the time. Um, again, to start off, what is the purpose behind this work? What is the aim of this work? No better place to go to than the author himself. This is not in your selections, but it's in the text, and I think it's very important to see what he feels is the main objective behind this work. And he writes, my primary object in this work is to explain certain words occurring in the prophetic books. Right? It is not here intended to explain all these expressions to the unlettered or to mere tyros, a previous knowledge of logic and natural philosophy being indispensable. Right? So already from the outset, he's very clear that to fully understand what's being discussed and to fully understand revelation, right, that's what he means here by the prophetic books, right? a previous knowledge of logic and natural philosophy is indispensable. So already you see the place and role, as far as Ibn Maymun is concerned, of philosophy. Of course, he'll discuss this further. The object of this treatise, he says, is to enlighten a religious man who has been trained to believe in the truth of our holy law, who conscientiously fulfills his moral and religious duties, and at the same time has been successful in his philosophical studies. Right? And somehow there, there's a point of tension there. He says, human reason has attracted him to abide within its sphere. And he finds it difficult to accept as correct the teaching based on the literal interpretation of the law, and especially that which he himself or others derive from those homonyms, sorry, uh, those homonymous, metaphorical, or hybrid expressions. Hence, he is lost in perplexity and anxiety. And this is the guide for the perplexed. Right? So the idea here, and this is a very similar vein you will see also in Ibn Rushd, the importance of interpretation, right? uh, um, understanding the revelation. Okay? So he says, here's someone who is a faithful believer. He fulfills his moral duties. He is very faithful. But he's now encountered philosophy, and he understands the work within the confines of reason. And somehow he finds a, a conflict between accepting the literal level of the revelation and his reasoning or his rational processes. And again, this is something that Ibn Rushd will address. This work has also a second objective, Maimonides writes. It seeks to explain certain obscure figures, which statements, words, which occur in the prophets and are not distinctly characterized as being figures. Ignorant and superficial leader, readers take them in a literal, not in a figurative sense, even when informed persons are bewildered if they understand these passages in their literal signification. But they are entirely relieved of their perplexity when we explain the figure or merely suggest that the terms are figurative. For this reason, I have called this book Guide for the Perplexed. Right? So right from the beginning, he sets it up very clearly. The root of perplexity and the answer to it. Right? The answer to it, of course, is to read things figuratively, not to take them literally. And he's very clear on which passages in your reading selections, which references to the divine am I talking about. Right? Uh, what does it mean to say that God is loving, for instance? Okay? Mo I won't say more. Um, to set it out, however, he says very clearly that and this is in your selections uh, from chapters 51 and 52 of book one. He says, what does it mean to say I want to understand the divine? Right? Of course, it doesn't mean to be able to 
state all the things mentioned about the divine in Revelation. In other words, if I say that God is merciful, just, loving, wrathful, none of this is understanding the divine. All of this is a you know interesting ability to enumerate certain things said about the divine. Right? But to fully understand the divine is a different engagement. And in the first part of your readings, he wants to show very, very clearly that one cannot have any way of understanding the essence of the divine. Right? So what do we do? Don't worry, there's an answer. But to show this, he says, let us first accept this. There cannot be any belief in the unity of God except by admitting that he is one simple substance. This statement is very important. It means that however the unity is understood, it must be understood as something non that you cannot partition. Right? So when we speak about, example, when we speak about God being merciful, I don't mean that one part of God is mercy. I cannot speak about a part of a unity, right? absolute unity. Right? So it has to be understood in that sense. This is simple unity. Without any composition or plurality of elements. It's not composed of elements. Okay? One, from whatever side you view it, and by whatever test you examine it, not divisible into parts in any way and by any cause, nor capable of any form of plurality, either objectively or subjectively, as will be proved in this treatise. Right? And so again, you see, this is, th this is for him something that, according to, uh, to Ibn Maymun, only philosophical reasoning can address this. Okay? So he goes through different, the five different ways we can normally define something to show us that None of these ways actually apply to the divine, right? Again, I'm not going to go into the details, of course. I leave that up to you in your class discussions. But very briefly, for instance, one describes something by definition. Explanation of a name containing the true essence of the subject. Oh, sorry, of the object, right? Uh, and he says, all agree that this kind of description cannot be given of God, for there are no previous causes to his existence by which he could be defined. Let me try very briefly to, to give you something of, um, in, you know, applicable example. So we say the human is a rational animal, right? That's description, definition by description. But for me to say that the human is a rational animal, prior to the human there has to be rationality, animality, so to speak, and then the human is that, right? Or even if I simply say the human exists, right? Being as a state of existence has to be prior to the human. Does that make sense? So if I were to, go, to say something similar about God as describing his essence, God is just. That would mean justice stands outside God, for instance. Right? Um, okay, maybe too much to throw at you. But basically, there's no way you can do this kind of definition as description about God. You can't do definition in terms of parts, because as we said, God cannot be understood in parts. You cannot do description by quantity and quality. Of course, God has no quantity, has no quality, etc., and so on and so forth. But if none of these approaches can allow me to understand the divine, to describe the divine, to define the divine, how then, as a monotheist, immersed now in rational thinking, am I to understand the divine? And Ibn Rush says very, sorry, Ibn Maymun says very clearly, we know God by knowing what he is not. Right? This is the via negativa, as we call it. Right? And he says, know that the negative attributes, that what, that's what we mean by negative attributes, to say, for instance, God is not material. Right? God is not subject to change, right? This is knowledge. This is a form of knowledge. In fact, for Maimonides, this is the form of knowledge as far as knowledge of God is concerned. Know that the negative attributes of God are the true attributes. They do not include any incorrect notions or any deficiency whatever in reference to God, while positive attributes, i.e. attributes we posit about God versus we negate, right, negative, positive attributes imply polytheism, and are inadequate, as we have already shown. Right? So not only do they not give you a sense of a better understanding of the divine, he goes as far as saying they actually imply polytheism. Right? Um, to do this, to fully understand this for Maimonides, is only possible through a knowledge of logic and natural philosophy. So again, like with Ibn Rushd, to fully understand revelation and the divine within revelation, I need philosophy and, and logical reasoning, right? And so you can see with both of these authors that their emphasis is that their, their treatises are ones that are presented to 
highlight, to emphasize the place and role of, philosoph of philosophical reasoning within a monotheistic context, within a, a Judaic or Islamic monotheistic context. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Thank you.